I'm Matt Reynolds, and this is my podcast. I can do the job, but running the business is quite difficult. But a lot of tradesmen lack, and I was probably one of them, is business skills. I don't mind making mistakes. You learn from your mistakes. Information is all around you in the minds of people that work beside you. Welcome to Trench Talk. I'm Matt Reynolds, I'm a plumber, and this week, Stefan Gazakis joined me on the podcast. The idea of these discussions, for those of you joining us for the first time, is to go into the trenches of achievement and talk, not with people who are orchestrating from some lofty perspective, but to those high performers who are actually in the trenches, honing their craft. That has included guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, all of whom are on the front lines doing amazing things. This episode is all about growing businesses. Stefan is founding principal of Business Benchmark Group and has spent more than two decades at the forefront of business, including 25 years as a business owner across multiple industries. He has earned a reputation as a leading business strategist for small business owners, many of whom he has coached to extreme profit growth, award-winning success, and a greater quality of life. Stefan has also worked with industry leaders such as Telstra, Westfield, and The NAB. He has authored two books titled From Deadwood to Diamonds and How to Grow a Business, in addition to being a regular contributor to national publications such as the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age, Franchise Council Australia, BRW, Australian Women's Weekly, and The Accountant. We discuss strategies for growing businesses, why many business owners fail to scale their operation, how he manages his own diary, rebuilding his family's textile business back from the brink of collapse to 70 plus employees, becoming a major supplier to Nike, and designing the hooded racing suit Cathy Freeman used to win the gold medal at the Sydney Olympic Games. If you'd like to know more about Stefan and his work, you can find him at both stefangazakis.com and businessbenchmarkgroup.com.au. To get every episode of Trench Talk on release, please remember to hit the subscribe button inside your chosen podcast player. Enjoy my chat with Stefan Gazakis. Stefan Gazakis, thanks for doing this. Now, we're in your boardroom in your offices in Doncaster this morning. Thank you for having me in. First time we've met. Now, I did a little bit of looking on your website before I came in, and you invite um, business owners to come in and have a coffee and chat about what they do in their business. Is there, or when typically does a business call you for a caffeine fix? (laughs) That's a really good way of uh, putting it, uh, Matt, and thank you for having me here to begin with. Look, the the general reason... um, why, why business owners, particularly business owners are we or I, uh, I guess, catch up and, and have a chat, let's call it that coffee meeting, is um, not so much when they're broken. It's um, the business owners that we work with are uh, committed, dedicated, hardworking business owners who are uh, on their way to something, building something, but they're at a crossroad. Um, it's not exactly broken. It's not exactly uh, giving them what they want or what they had hoped it would give them as, as a business and their quality of life. So... Generally, it's when um, business owners are at a crossroad to go to the next level. And when you go to the next level, there's a couple of things that play out. It's, it's the type of customer you want to be serving to give you the opportunity to uh, keep on growing your rep- reputation. But it's also the type of people you need in your business to give you a better utilisation and or a better effectiveness um, for your success and ultimately building that reputation. So generally, we meet people that need a better quality of customer and ultimately a better quality of team member within their organisation. They're the two key reasons, although they don't really know that. And is there a typical size business that comes to you or are those problems the same no matter what the size is? It's just relative. Uh, look, the, the, the typical size um, is, is anywhere between $1 to $10 million in, um, in, in revenue, just as a, uh, I guess, a, a reference point. Mm-hmm. Um, generally speaking, five to ten people on the team albeit we do work with companies that are at 100 million and three to 400 uh, people on the team as well. So when we say typical, it it, it definitely slants towards small, medium enterprise and it's generally that $1 to $20 million that we're doing a really good job with in being their outsourced CEO and, and, and holding them to account with better scoreboards and better activities and ultimately a really clear understanding of how is this playing out with the numbers in the business. So your business is like outsourcing, as you just said, a board, right? Correct. In, in a small business, you obviously can't afford to have – how many team members have you got here? We have um, seven and we're just about to hire uh, two more. Okay. And generally speaking, four of us are uh, involved as senior strategists, as senior tacticians in, in, in people's businesses to help them, again, confirm a plan, 
action a plan, be accountable to a plan, but also be in a situation where we're measuring and correcting so we come back and have a better version of execution against the plan. And how involved do you get in the businesses that you work with? Look, we have a saying, if our, if our vision of our client's business is greater than their vision of their business, we have a problem. So we, we stay as involved and as objective to ensure that the total ownership of what happens between our meetings, our sessions, which is generally fortnights apart, yep. um, are generally in the hands of the business owner and or their leadership team to execute. What happens from that execution is they come back and they confirm, did we or did we not do what we were meant to do? So the whole aspect of accountability and also clarity as to what are we working on. So our involvement is making sure that, okay, what we decided was the plan, what we actually went out and executed as far as our activities, what actually happened versus what we thought would would happen. Okay. So again, true to a CEO and or a general management perspective, we're looking at things from a very, okay, how does this support the goal that we're trying to achieve? How do we support the financial, I guess, freedom? How do we support the growing of a team that has, you know, a line of A graders wanting to join the team? Yep. But most importantly, how do we ensure that we're building a reputation that has a line of A grade customers, ideal customers wanting to do business with us? How do you define an A grade customer? Well, that's a very good question. So for every business, that's very different. And, and to give you a really good example there, I mean, we're, we're at Westfield. Our offices here are at Westfield, Doncaster. Yep. Downstairs, there's three $2 shops. And this is a really cool example. So if you went into the uh, centre and you visited every $2 shop, you will discover that there's a very different target market customer for each $2 shop downstairs. So dependent upon the owner, dependent against the, 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 the vision and or the plan as to who is the customer that we wish to serve. Okay. How is it that we're going to serve them? How is it that we stay memorable in their mind determines what is an A-grade customer. So, so it's different this, for every business is what you're saying? Oh, totally. Look, we work with a lot of trade businesses, a lot of um, professional services, a lot of manufacturing businesses, yep. and every one of those has a very distinct version of what is their ideal customer. So one of the observations I've made through doing a series of these interviews with uh, people who are successful and certainly working in that space is that the success of your business almost seems to be tied to how well you know yourself. Would that be a fair statement and also where you want to go? Oh, look, tra- travelling the world doing what I do, Matt, um, I'm yet to see a bad business. Okay. What I generally get to see and I'm and, and okay because I can't be a judge of this yep. is not so qualified business owners <laughs> making bad business decisions. Yep. So it's the stuff that we don't know that ultimately gets in our way of what is a successful outcome. And for most business owners, we sort of get caught up in the day-to-day and, and, and I guess the, the challenge of having made decisions that didn't work and the inertia of not wanting to make another decision because I'm just not good at this. Yeah. So there's no such thing as a bad business, but there is an opportunity to be a better business owner making better business decisions. Okay. So definitely understanding yourself, your strengths, and what is it that you need to feel the void of your weaknesses, let's call it, yeah. is what makes a difference. So many, many business owners do get advice on working on their weaknesses. Yeah. And in my opinion, you know, we have strengths for a certain reason. Why don't they become the sole focus of what you do as a leader in your business Uh, and complement yourself with areas that need, um, I guess, improvement or or topping up, which means you've you've got to have a really good grip on who you are as an individual and your leadership style or your management style or your best employee in the business style to ensure you keep on focusing on that while you support yourself with building a team that focuses on the other things. That's definitely about knowing yourself. So you seem to have, and this is the first time I've met you, so I don't actually know personally, but you (laughs) seem to have a bit of a reputation for being very good at delegation. So is there a system that sits behind that? Because it seemed like within that answer you were saying that you want to stick with your strengths and you want to get rid of the rest to more qualified people, if that's putting it in really, really simple terms. Absolutely. More, More qualified is a reference point. More dedicated to doing the things that you don't like doing is another way of looking Probably at it. Probably more important, right? And, and if you're the owner of a business, um, so, sometimes the fallacy is, oh, no, no, I've got it. If it's meant to be, it's up to me. 
or you know, if I work harder, they'll work harder, and that's just that that was true in the nineteen seventies and even nineteen sixties. Yeah. But where we are right now, delegation and, and giving people an opportunity to uh, you know perform better today at what it is that they're responsible for is is, is the way of the game and and the way of the game going forward. So the better I stick to what I'm really good at and empower you and give you an opportunity to be better at what you're doing today so you have a better version of it tomorrow, that's definitely going to win the game. So the tool the tool that we generally refer to is a um, what would your perfect calendar look like? So in the first book that I wrote, I, I really go into detail around what does a perfect calendar look like? Now, perfect calendar isn't about utopia or let's sit by the campfire singing Kumbaya. I mean, this is business and it's about 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours of highly effective, highly efficient time being used. Yep. Now, because we're humans, there's going to be downtime. There's going to be interruption time. There's going to be distraction time. So if we look at our, our perfect calendars and say, okay, what would it look like if 70% of our hours in the business were very focused on our top three to five activities? Okay, so you're not even shooting for 100% from the start. No chance. There okay. is, no, I mean, 23 years down the track in being a student to the perfect calendar model, I'm striking at about 86% right now. Okay. So our meeting this morning was at 9.30. Yep. We started at 9.32. Well, you're late. That's correct. <laughs> so that's not as bad as 70% though, is it? No, that's right. <laughs> so, so, so it's okay. Again, the unforgiving aspect of, oh, no, I need to be regimented. No, we're human beings. We need to give ourselves a flexibility of not being perfect and this is where half the issue is. So if I create a calendar that's 70% perfect and then every other day I am measuring in the actual One's the perfect calendar, the other one's the actual. Yep. What am I doing versus what I thought I would be doing? How am I executing versus what I thought I'd be executing? How am I trending as a ratio? No different to a financial budget. Yes. What did I think will happen versus what is actually happening? So think of time as money, which is actually what it is anyway. So. Yeah, and think of money in 60-minute increments. So 60 minutes on, 30 minutes off. 60 minutes on, 30 minutes off. Now, that roughly equals 60, 66%. I don't want to get too caught up in the numbers here. Yes. But it just paints a picture. Because as human beings, you will get that mobile phone ringing. You will have an urge to go to the toilet. You might need to have a break, and you should. So if you think about 60 minutes on, but highly effective, what are the two, three things I'm doing in the 60 minutes? And this is the desired outcome, plan. Uh-huh. What's actually happening? So that's that's a methodology or a tool that we call the perfect calendar, but only three to five key activities throughout the week. So a lot of business owners that would come to you, I'm assuming, would have a list that's a lot longer than three to five, right? So you have to get rid of the other 10 or 15. What's the process of doing that? Well, we, we, we help them understand, okay, on a, on, a, on, a typical, on a typical day, in a typical month, what are the top 10 things that you do? Yeah, and what would be an example of a couple of, of those? Uh, buying the milk for the fridge, opening the doors in the morning, yep. signing the cheque, making the best sale, uh, handing over to the operations team, occasionally getting caught up in the operational team, writing the invoice, yep. ringing the, the, the debtor to collect the the the, uh, the payment, uh, some of your typical, just loosely speaking. Yep. And what we say is, okay, well, that, that's coverage across the three key areas of business. Uh-huh. What is it as a leader and an owner that are your most relevant three? Okay. So we get them to make a list of ten and then we say, okay, pick your relevant three. And what's the relevant three? The ones that you have better income generating opportunity, better highly rate in, uh, in, in, in dollar terms, what is the value that you provide makes it the relevant three. So for most owners, particularly business owners that are running businesses under $10 million, under $20 million, Matt, the most relevant thing that they do is keep on focusing on growing resources, so growing people. Yeah. If I'm investing an hour with you, if you're on my team and I'm investing an hour with you every week, half an hour with you every week, just confirming how are you going versus how you could be going. What is it that you need to share with me so that I'm understanding you better? How is it that I can provide better tools for you? How is it that we as a team, as an organisation, could be performing better? Yep. If I'm investing one hour with you every week, that's roughly about 46 to 48 hours a, a year. What do you think happens to you if you're on my team? 
if I'm on your team, I'm first of all going to feel that my uh, opinion and my voice is heard and that I have a at least an opportunity to make a contribution to where we're going. Correct. And, and if that is what a, 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 um, occurs mentally, then physically we're going to be in a position where you contribute more okay. because it's a live yep. conversation week on week. Yep. So that's called growing resources. And most business owners, they would love to do it or even the ones that feel that they've got a dysfunctional team and they can't believe that these guys are on their team, and guys means girls as well, by the way. Yes. Um, so they, they neglect the most important task in their business, and that's growing people. As it is, in most small businesses, um, the, the owner of the business in the first and second and third phase of business, they are the best front man or salesperson in their business. They make it easy for the outside world to buy in because they still have the underlying passion for their business. They're the best representative for their business. So that's how we we, we ensure that our business owners and leaders ensure that they're creating a list that's called what are the top 10 things that you do each week and how do we sandwich that down to the relevant three, which is an hourly rate identity. And if we focus on what is your highest hourly rate identity by three to five key activities, what that actually means is we start shaping your diary your perfect diary against those threes. And guess what? Why don't you pick two more that you love doing yeah. and we'll keep them as number four and number five. You're allowed to do them but only 10% of the week. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's 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 structuring. Um, it's probably structuring what you know you should be doing but never get around to doing it. Correct. Because we're always caught up in the urgent. So this um, – th- so the delegation um, – come back to the delegation question. Those other things need to be done by other people. So if, it's you- a de- if it's a delegation – if it's a delegation and you're in small business, you're not at a stage where a robot will do it. Yep. There is an opportunity to keep on improving systems and by systems is also an aspect of automation. So there is an element of system improvement. And our saying is great systems followed by good people that know what they're there to do yep. and ultimately are clear about their responsibilities yes. and how they get measured for results. So great systems, good people, eventually great systems, great people, Yep. influencing a better version of great systems. And that's how we keep on lifting the standard. One grows the other. Totally. But 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 the very and most important part about that is you've got to be okay to be investing in systems. Predictability. So I had a question here to ask you about why many businesses fail to scale. Why is that difficult? They're not prioritising their diary that one key aspect? What are the, what are the general sort of uh, things that you see? Because I'm assuming that, let's say, a, uh, a trade business of two to five people comes to you. Is there a common set of three or four problems that, they, that everyone has that everyone needs to get over and improve on and get better on to grow? Yeah, so, so, so the aspect of scale is about resources being duplicated. So the key, the key to scalability is definitely around having an organisational chart, evolution, in our business, at Business Benchmark Group, we, we focus on what we call the cluster. Okay. So in any, in any walk in life, the best number of people in any cluster is a group of seven. Okay. That's, that comes, and that's, that's, and that's an army. It comes from an well, early the, the, on. There is, there is a strategic okay. element to this, yes. which goes back to, to military. And, yeah, yeah. And ultimately, it's, it's about relationships. Yes. And without getting into too much detail, the formula for relationships equals this. X squared minus X divided by 2. So a group of 7 squared equals 49. Minus 7 equals 42. Divided by 2 equals 21 relationships. Okay. So many of us get to the end of a day and we think, oh, you won't believe what happened to us today. You will not believe. You go home, you kick the cat, you talk to your husband, you talk to your wife and you're complaining about, you will not believe what happened in the office today. I've got nothing done. I just got caught up in all the bullshit. In fairness... The cluster in that business has got about 10 people in it, yep. 15 people in it. There's been no middle management approach or middle tier approach. And it's not about down, up, up, down or down, up. It's about how do you ensure you're managing an inclusion environment. So scalability is when you understand that 21 relationships is a, is, is, is a heap of relationships that need to be managed, all moving in the same direction, strategic, but being tactful as to what needs to be done every day. Okay. Anything more than that, you're going to get inertia and procrastination and leaks, which means you're not going to scale. So to scale, you need to divide the teams. 
Yes, divide to conquer is another yep. <laughs> or divide to scale in business and being commercial. So okay. out of your bottom tier becomes your future leaders. Right. So if you keep on if you keep on investing in the next tier and the next tier under that, you get your future leaders coming out of the first or, 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 or bottom tier. They become your future leaders that become the leaders of another tier. Now that doesn't happen immediately. But over the course of two to three years, as the leadership team is out there growing business opportunity, because we can, as the back end part of the business is delivering on opportunity and growing reputation, yep. and we're growing people, which ultimately become leaders of future people in our team, there's your scalability model. Okay. And we have plenty of examples, and, and particularly, you know, across the board. I mean, I've just come from a meeting where, you know, one of our clients has gone from $5 million to 15 to 42 and now they're trending to $80 million oh, wow. in the space of six years. Okay. And, and in saying that, the owner has got more time on their hands right now to be thinking about, okay, we've just structured ourselves in Fiji, in the Philippines, and we've got our China, um, um, I guess, manufacturing plant up and running. Our management team's still in Melbourne. We're now setting up a management team in Sydney for some of the um, local opportunities there. He's doing less hands-on work today than he used to, but his middle tier has continued to scale on the back of the cluster system. Have you worked with that business through that that period, the Absolutely. entire period? Oh, you have? Yeah. And, and that's one example, Matt. Yep. Uh, we have trade-based businesses, which I, I understand, you know, you, you're aware of intimately that, yep. you know, have start, that they've knocked on our door where they had, you know, 10 or so people on the team holistically, internal, external. Yep. They're now moving towards 30 and 40 people on the team. Their business is five and six times the size it was, but the ownership and leadership teams – Against that structured approach that I just shared with you, yep. the cluster approach is doing less and less hands-on work and more and more strategic business growth work. Uh, one of our clients, um, again, a, a formidable plumbing organisation that has got a significant niche, almost owns, it, owns its niche in, in Melbourne and is now spreading across Australia. Um, I remember working with that gentleman um, nine years ago we started where it was just him and two um, subcontractors and he was working out of his flat in Ringwood, um, which is an eastern suburbs um, um, location here in Melbourne. And and now he's, 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 he's just about to move into his um, new facility, which is going to house, you know, 80-odd people and he's now oh, set wow. up in Sydney and Brisbane and expanding. And, and that's on the back of clusters, you know, people leading people. Opportunities being seized and conquered as far as better quality customers who allow us to make margin and profit so we're reinvesting back into the business. See, the quality of your customer will also determine the quality of your team. The quality of the leadership team will determine the quality of the customer that's ultimately led by a quality team. Does that make sense? It does, which all stems from the intention, the standards that the business owner holds probably first for themselves yeah. before anyone else. Totally. And, and at some point, the owner's got to be okay, the original owner, yeah. has got to be okay to stand aside and let this thing go. That wouldn't be a problem at all, would it? It's no, it business? is just a massive <laughs> You got me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? So, so, you know, having born and bred in a, in a family business that, again, it was never my intention to take over that business, uh, you know, to see, to see what needed to happen for us to change the fate in the second generation uh, was, was quite interesting living that out in the early 90s. Uh, but ultimately, no, business owners uh, definitely get in the way of um, opportunity and global opportunity at that, dare me say. Now, I want to come to your um, family and business history in just a minute, but I've got I've got one more question you'd ask before we jump there. The foundation of your what you uh, teach and what you work with businesses on comes down to as you define it, your six pillars. Is that for, is that the backbone of what your structure everything around? Yeah. So so we um what we understand in in, in business and and small business and, and it generally plays out in middle and definitely upper end business. There's three key areas in business. Yep. But there's six defining pillars within those three areas. And and the first and the most important is operations. How will this business flow? How will we how are we making decisions around the type of customer, the type of team and how will we will we deliver on time and on budget? 
Yep. Thereafter is knowing, okay, well, how are we going to know, which is the finance pillar, how will we know that we're actually trending and, and confirming we're on the right path? So the financial pillar scores the operational pillar. Everything we do in business will end up being a number. Yeah. Because the language of business, no matter what you do, is finance. Yeah. So to have a base level of financial literacy and an appetite to look at the scoreboard and turn numbers into words, mm -hmm. which is strategy, and words back into numbers, which is planning and execution and correction, yep. right, is ultimately the key to the ultimate success. Okay. It's like playing football and watching the scoreboard and all of a sudden the MCG scoreboard goes down. Yeah. Game's still a great game, but there's no scoreboard. Now what? Yeah, there's no right? interest, There's a right? problem. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Business is no different. Third pillar is marketing, understanding huh? who your ideal customer is, yep. why we chose them and how we're going to make it easy to attract them. Sales, how do we make it easy for them to buy? It's, 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 a, it's a model. It's a framework. It's not because you're a good salesperson that people buy from you. It's because you made it easy for them to buy. That's a system. I know for myself that sometimes it, when you review what you're doing from the mindset of a customer, you can see how hard it is sometimes to do business with you, right? There's people like... Oh. No, knocking down your door to give you money <laughs> and you uh, do everything you do. You can not to take it in some instances. Correct. Which, which, so sales is the fourth pillar. The fifth yep. pillar is customer loyalty. The only time they ever come back and do more business with you is if you did the first time, second time and the most recent time as you promised and a little bit more. So they need to become advocates of your business. That is a significant pillar in business. And because if, if I don't need to reinvest marketing dollars and or effort, Yep. to attract more customers because I'm keeping the one I've got. That's called the baseline of growth. Having them come back is critical. So customer loyalty is the fifth pillar. And the sixth and fundamentally the one that gives us scale and opportunity to duplicate is team. But not just team where arms and legs are counted, but heart and mind count. Team where they've got ownership in the mind yep. and in the heart. And they behave in a certain way as if they had the key to the door and writing every single check that's needed in the business. Does that make sense? It does make sense. So how do you get your – this is a big question, I know, and probably complicated answer as well. How do you get your team on board with where you want to go? Is there some techniques around that? Yeah, it's called be honest with them. Okay. Broadly, be honest with Transparent. them. Transparent. Yeah, communication. So I'm having one-on-ones with you. I'm sharing with you with where we're going and how you fit into that and how I wish you could contribute at a higher level and I'm going to give you every opportunity to do that. In a grander boardroom or team meeting, ensure that you are consistent with what is the truth, okay. the transparency so, about what we need to be accountable to so that we have something that's going somewhere. That is the tr that, that, that's, that's the secret. Nothing complicated about that. So the buy-in is based on communication fundamentally. Yeah, and reality checks. Okay. This is where we're going. How are we trending today? What is it that we can do tomorrow so we're trending better? So a bias to a high-performance challenge, Matt, is the key. Okay. A high-performance challenge is about setting the standard. I cannot be the only one setting a standard in the business. Yeah. I'm the one that leads it. The rest of us are part of. And I can't be better than you. We need to be better than. Yes. So tomorrow must be a better day than was today is a high-performance challenge. In my view, in my world, in over 25 years of being a business owner and leading hundreds of businesses, as I'm currently leading the business that I'm in right now, it's got nothing to do with how good I am. It's got to do with my ability, our ability to keep on raising the bar and believing that we can. That's it. So there's nothing tricky about that. And yet so many of us get it wrong. I was going to say, you make it sound so simple, which it is, ah, I guess, when you break it down, right? Yep. And business exactly doesn't need to be easy, but it was never meant to be this hard either. That's an interesting uh, observation. Stefan, where did you grow up? Grew up in Melbourne, obviously first born to migrant parents of the 1960s. Our mum and dad came from Greece in the mid-60s and... Um, Created a life, created an opportunity, as we um, as we understand many migrants around the world, but particularly in this part of the world in Australia. So by the early 70s, they had started their own business and, um, yeah, just worked hard and that's all they knew. They didn't go to school. They, um, they The reason they came to this country was because they, they just seeked a better quality of life. At, at what age did they land? Um, they were here in their... Dad was 19 and mum was 
18 when they arrived here. Wow. Um, they got married in in their um, a year later, and I was born, and Dad was 21, and Mum was 20. So, you know, as was the case back then, um, that was their, uh, their their story and their beginnings in a, a foreign country that took them 40 days in a ship to get to, not having the language, not having the skills, not having anything, and certainly no social media to connect with Mum and Dad back at home. Right? Did you ever ask them why they decided to leave? Many times, and, and, and I was, as, as a grown-up um, child and also a, a child that loved sitting around what, watching the elders and the, uh, and the more senior people when we got together in family um, environments, just talk about, you know, their reasoning and their, um, and their journey. It was always about quality of life, Matt, and um, I will say it's, st- it's still in my, um, in my opinion and one of my greatest drivers for building the business I'm building today and the reason I got into business coaching to start with 15 years ago was, and I'll get to the story in a moment, was to ensure that every business owner, every business owner understands what it means to have a better quality of life and what it takes to get there, but also be open and okay that everyone on their team needs to have the same. Okay. So the reason why they came out was because they just they just couldn't make ends meet. They had no, they were starving, they were hungry. There was no opportunity in, um, in, in southern Europe back then and um, there were no jobs and um, big families and, and the land couldn't sustain, I guess, a good quality of life. Okay. So they made the move. They came here and um, good people, great integrity, great ethics, great values, um, very important parts of being a, a, great, a great person in the world. So they worked hard. They built a business. By the late 80s, 1980s, they were in a position of financial retirement. And they were just in their forties at that point, as in in age. They were in the textile business. They were, in, right? the, they were in a textile manufacturing business. Yep. Uh, Mum and dad started that in the seventies, as I said, and they built it to about one hundred and ten people on their team by the late eighties. Oh, so it was a significant business. Oh, this thing was a monster, and 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 to be honest with you, I grew up hating that business because mum and dad okay. were never home. They just oh, knew how to work harder. They knew nothing different. We had a good quality life as far as the materialistic and myself and my sister grew up in an environment that always had plenty of things, way more things than mum and dad ever had in their early days. And, and mum and dad were very adamant that we needed to succeed in school so that we didn't need to work as hard as them. So one of their drivers was to provide for you. That- totally. So everything that they missed perhaps in their childhood, they just yeah. wanted to make sure there was an abundance of that for, um, I guess, our family. Uh, which is uh, interesting, isn't it? Because that's what you feel that you missed when you were young, them being there, is what you're now teaching business owners to do. And, and creating a better balance slash harmony for it. Ah, there you go. So there's nothing wrong with being a successful, financially viable, succeeding investor mindset type business. Yes. But on the same token, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. There has to be that balance. And it's a huge driver. I mean, for us, if you look at our paraphernalia here at Business Benchmark Group, the most important thing we do for our clients is we keep them true to what does a quality, a better quality of life mean for you? Yeah, and you just said And how do we use the vehicle of your career or business to get us there? Nothing else matters. I mean, we can take you to the highest highs on a global level and we've got plenty of um, track record for that in our business. But if you're there and you're lonely and you're having the best bottle of red that's available to you because you can, and you're on your own on that table drinking it, wow, that's just, let's just say that's crap. Yeah. <laughs> that's think, not yeah. on. <laughs> oh, I, being at the at the helm of a business of any size can be awfully lonely at times, can't, can't it? particularly if you don't have partners involved. So. Yeah, so, so, so the paradox um, for me growing up, Matt, just very quickly, is in 1986 I finished my um, year 12 studies and um, got accepted to a university um um, course and and again that was the ultimate prize for mum and dad. So as as a virtue of that, I guess um, that outcome for me, they bought me a brand new BMW. Uh, oh wow! Um, Cooper's a you know a, a reward and a and just a thank you that I was able to get to school and get to the point of university and what have you. Now that was that was an interesting situation because five years later. In the early uh, in the early nineties, we needed to sell that car to put food on the table. Interesting. So from the period of the late eighties 
to the early, very early 90s, mum and dad went from being, you know, financially retired. They did not, they didn't need to work because they needed more money. Yeah, I'm going to ask respectfully why. Because they invested in properties, they, they had cash flow at a level, their mortgage was paid for. So they, they really did well financially. Yep. They still were working hard though. They knew nothing else. All they knew was that they were the leaders of that business yep. and it was a pancake structure. It was them and then 110 people. There was no rules of delegation. There was no organisational chart. There was nothing, again, not because they didn't trust. Actually, they trusted too much and hence why they ended up losing yeah, that's empire. what I was asking. Yeah, so was there a reason why their business uh, had a downward turn? Yes. In the late 80s, there was, there was an element in Australia of people losing a lot of money. Now, the reason my parents lost a lot of money is because they trusted some people. So their terms of trade with their customers was a handshake versus uh, a contract. Yeah. Their ability to ensure that there was some clear rules of engagement. So they trusted people they should not have. They had got into property deals they had never should have. They were never equipped, I guess, from an education perspective as to how to make those investor-type decisions. So when, when that recession that Australia needed to have occurred, as many people back then, mum and dad were part of that wash-up. So I was living overseas at this point. I had graduated from my um, university degree. I'd gone overseas. I decided to live there for a period. And I was on my way back to my sister's um, wedding. And this was early 1991. And I, um, I came home to realise that our home that we had grown up on uh, grown up in was almost on mortgagee, um, it was going to be mortgaged, um, mortgagee auctioned by the bank. So times were bad financially. Oh, they'd gone from 110 people to four people in the space oh, wow. of two years. Yeah. So if, if that's a paradox of what happens versus what could happen, yep. if you've got no structures in place in your business, that's a really good example. So reluctantly when I got back and realised what was going to happen, um, I had to step in, not because, I mean, I was just really good at reading books and finishing exams at a high level. Mm -hmm. I was never in the real world ready for what I needed to step into. Did you ever work in that business out of interest? I, um, I, I Before this point? I was involved in doing some part-time work with bookkeeping and helping mum and dad with payroll. I had three other part-time jobs when I was doing my university degree right. and, and whatever. So I was okay in working and yeah. I had a work ethic, but I didn't understand running a business and growing business. Okay. So I took that business over in 1992. Okay, so that after the downturn had occurred. So 1991 Christmas I was here, 1992 I step in to take over. We'd gone down to four people yep. and two of those people were mum and dad. <laughs> yep. Right? I step in on only one proviso. If I'm stepping in, I need someone to help me make better decisions as to what we do going forward. How accepting of they were you, with you coming in under that proviso? Because that, that could be uh, – I'm not saying it was, but it could be uh, an emotional set of, <laughs> I suppose, problems could ar arise under those um, conditions or yeah, set of I, circumstances. And, and, I, and, I, and I constantly ponder on, on what may have happened if their circumstances were different. If mum and dad had a choice, yeah. in other words, they didn't have the, the, the turnaround they did at that point, firstly, I don't think I would have got involved because I grew up hating that business. And for the next 10 years, as you'll hear in a moment, I continued hating it every day. The fact that there was no choices and it was brick walls and stones, there was no choice for them to, okay, you know what, it's up to you, we're going to follow the lead. I said if it's up to me, I've read some books and I've gone, okay, we need to put on a, um, someone that's going to help us. Now, back in then, we're talking early 90s, there was no such thing as business coaching. I mean, business coaching is a very recent um, industry on a global level and definitely in Australia. Um, so back then... It was a mentor that we bought in. It was someone that was very great, very seasoned, and, and ultimately was not going to be my best friend. So along the journey with mum and dad was this, um, this gentleman that, again, I had, a you know, with my minimal involvement in previous years, had just built a little bit of a relationship with, and his name was Basil Port. And he, um, he ended up, um, I guess, coming on board to be a, a mentor, and, and nothing more, nothing less, um, just be someone that I bounce, okay, this is what I'm thinking, what do you think? And was it a paid full-time position? Was it coming once a week? Or? So, no, no, it was, um, again, it was a, it was a fortnightly um, uh, meeting that we had in place. 
Like how a, lot, a lot of what happens back then is followed through and filtered through for me. Right, yeah. So it was a fortnightly situation. It was definitely paid. The one thing I learned very early, and, and it was on the back of some of Basil's teachings, was um, 50% of something successful is way better than 100% of something that's not. So you've got to be okay to invest. And um, having the right people in the right places getting paid the right money being clear about their right responsibilities will always deliver the right results. Okay. But the key to that was getting paid the right money. And a lot of business owners, definitely my parents, did not do that. So these that, were early learnings in terms of my, I guess, my first steps into running a business. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely a paid role at the expense of me and in many cases mum and dad taking hun money home to, to put food on the table. So the first few years you were, you were, you were struggling? The first four years, Matt, we paid back 700 odd thousand dollars to everyone that we owed money to. Oh, wow. That's at awesome, the expense of us taking a wage home. So we had advisors at that turning point that said, you know what, just file for bankruptcy and you'll be fine. Uh, we decided not to do that because there were small business owners that we couldn't take to the cleaners because of you know our inability to make better decisions or safeguard the business. Did you at that point, you just said you failed to make better decisions, did you take ownership of that? Totally. So, so there's no, bl there no blame game going on? Oh, there, were, there, was, there was definitely interesting conversations behind closed walls in, at yeah. home <laughs> in the kitchen and there was plenty of moments of frustration where, you know, amongst, I guess, the three of us, mum, dad and I and occasionally uh, my sister, we would, um, you know, we would say, I can't believe you've put me in this situation. And, and you know, for me it was the time that I was going to be kicking off my career at that point. Mm -hmm. I sacrificed to get mum and dad and the family back in a position where we needed to make, you know, something out of a bad, bad situation to get mum and dad back to a better choice. Yeah. So the first four years were, 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 were tough, hence why we had to sell the BMW yep. to put food on the table. You know, I remember those days um, I would be going out with my friends um, and my mates and we would be going out and I'd be drinking water because um, I wasn't in a position to shout back if I was shouted. Yeah, right, okay. You know, so anyway, that, and I've got to say, you know, that, that, that occurred for the next 10 years. So the first four years were tough. And if I didn't have Basil to just support me mentally and, and emotionally, but also teach me some of the uh, the fundamental feet on the ground, the stuff that I didn't know around financial literacy. I mean, I did a commerce. I, I completed a commerce degree. I studied economics, accounting, and legal at at a university level. But in fairness, I was just good at reading books and completing exams. Right? Can you remember any single lesson that Basil taught you on, yeah, yeah. from a financial totally. point of view? Totally. He, he, he taught me that um, no good going and winning a $1 million contract if it's going to cost us a million and one to get there. Okay. So let's understand what the cost of goods sold are and confirm what the gross profit should be. And from there, let's not pimp our ride by, let's say, I'll give you a recent example. You don't need an Apple computer if you're a tradesman. You just too, need a good Dow computer. Because they're too expensive and they get well, broken and all that sort of If you're things. a web designer. Yep or you're into graphic design, you need an Apple computer, which costs $2,000 more than a Dell computer. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good example of pimping your ride. So he taught me about running it lean. He also taught me that no, one's get, no one gets rich by cutting expenses. Because you, eventually you reach zero and you're stagnant, right? Or In by cutting expenses, possible. you need to work harder at being what? The best employee. Yep. So you need to become a better investor of your money at every level of your business. So on the expense side, it's very uh, short-term gain. It, it runs out. But on the investment side, there's unlimited potential, right? No, it's, it, it, it's a mindset. Every dollar we invest in our business. Yep. Oh, this, so you're talking about simple. investment into your own business. Oh, totally. Yeah, okay, got it. Yep. If I'm going to spend money with you, Matt, if I'm going to invest in you, Matt. As an employee of your there's business. There's the two different words. Yep. If I'm going to spend money on you, if I'm going to invest in you, Matt, which yep. one do you think has a better opportunity for success? Well, investment and it comes with it, you know. Which, also, which one also forces me to think, what am I talking about? Investment, yeah. So that forces me to be more strategic yep. and more tactful. Every dollar we spend in our business, these are the lessons, these are the primary lessons I learned and they're all in, in my books too. The, every dollar we invest in our business is about keeping the current customer that we have or creating a new one. Even the toilet paper that we invest in 
every week in our business, the water that we supply to our team, the milk that we buy for our team, that can be either an expense or that can be an investment. It depends on how you think about it. So every dollar we spend in our business is either going to help you keep a customer you have or get you a new one, period. Every line on the profit and loss statement should be viewed that way. So there's some of the fundamental feet on the ground, rigid, hard edge type of lessons that I learnt in my early day that still continue to this day to be the lessons that we teach great businesses run by good business owners that eventually become great business owners leading good teams that follow great systems that become great people on someone else's team growing great systems to another level. Lift the standard, some of the fundamentals. took me 10 years to turn that business around. We ended up growing that business back to 70 people Okay. in an in-house benchmark business model for Australia. So you were putting this model that you now teach together under real conditions. Correct. And that was my first example of doing it in real life, unbeknown to me that it was going to become my launching pad to growing something that's influencing right now thousands of people and thousands of families called my business coaching business. Yeah. You know, helping people have a better quality of life has a ripple that's far more. You know, we, we measure in our business how many people do we influence in employment every single year. One of our internal KPIs is how many more can we influence. That's only on the back of if we help greater business owners, greater business leaders keep on being better at what they do so that they're needing more people to be delivering their product or service, then the more of the more of the more equals abundance. That's an awesome KPI and we celebrate that on a quarterly and definitely an annual basis. Okay. We measure that number, how many people are involved yep. and are given job security, which helps people pay mortgages, put food on the table, belong to something going somewhere. It's absolutely remarkable. That's an internal KPI of ours. We measure that. So over the next 10 years, the first four years were challenging at about the fourth year mark, we engaged or Nike engaged us as a supplier to this project. On the back of that, doing whatever it takes to deliver on time and on budget for Nike. In 1995, 96, that was. And that was a pretty, um, and Nike were significantly growing their they were um, just, in Australia, right? Or yeah. they were just about to enter that real expansion phase. Yeah, totally. That, that's when, you know, that, that brand just went boom, boom. And then boom. Yeah. They, um, so in 1995, 96, it would have been around that time, we, um, we just kept on, you know what, they were on my top 10 hit list of that would be an ideal customer that we want to serve. That is an ideal profile of a customer we need to supply to. So on the back of just, you know, healthy harassment, let's call it, and, and value contribution, value whatever it takes, turning up as and when I said I would and five minutes sooner, right? Yeah. We ended up getting a project. It was their first toddler range in, in Australia for Nike. And, oh, wow. um, so we delivered that and we were exceptional in how we did that. And we had a lot of learnings. And we had to call on everyone we knew in Melbourne to ensure we got that delivery done. And um, on the back of that, um, fast forward the next um, six years, we actually, um, that became our number one customer as we became the number one provider in Australia for product that was manufactured in Australia. Right. So on a monthly basis, we were delivering twenty to 25,000 units across T-shirts, polo tops, sweaters, hoodies, tracksuit pants. We, did, we were the major supplier to the Sydney Olympics 2000 when oh, Reebok man. failed in their, uh, in their contract and Nike had to be called in as the last-minute saviour as the apparel sponsor we stepped in to be their major supplier in Australia because the time was very tight. We were the guys who created the prototype for the Kathy Freeman running suit that she eventually Oh, wore. is that right, the hooded suit? We had Carl Lewis visit our facility amongst many, many celebrities and, and identities in the sporting world. Yeah. Our factory was one of the, one of the ones that they were visiting um, and it was we were a code of conduct factory which – we took the risk with Nike to create that. Remember how they were always challenged around unfair labour and yeah, having shoes yeah. made for three cents and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. In fairness, that was um, they were the best version of keeping it above board than anyone else in the market. Now, yeah. 
on the back of Nike being our um, our number one customer and all the systems and all the progression, and we were building team now, right? Building everything that we shared in the first part of our um, interview, yeah. which is what we teach our clients right now. Nike knocks on the door. Puma knocks on the door. New Balance knocks on the door. We became oh, wow. the principal um, um, supplier to the Australian Open, the AFL, the NRL. They ended up being our customers on the back of building reputation of being an organisation that delivered on time and on budget and a little bit more than what we promised. Okay. But we had a professionalism approach. At a time when Southeast Asia and manufacturing in China and Vietnam and parts of India were becoming a a genuine choice in the apparel industry. Yeah, they were starting, to get, they were starting of, to get really good at that point, yeah. And also one of the issues why mum and dad failed in the late 90s. So just to bring this story to a bit of a conclusion for you, so for the for the 10 years that I was obviously leading and, and ultimately being where the buck stopped, mm-hmm. my number one goal, regardless of how exciting the business became, I still turned up in my mind hating that business every day. Even after all that? yeah. Every day, it was not my choice to be there and my only get-out-of-jail card was the moment mum and dad were in a position where they had some choice, we were selling and we were getting out. So we had about four or five attempts in selling the business. Mm-hmm. We did eventually sell it to a, uh, to, a, to, to a chap that was working within the business and he now runs it out of Fiji oh, yeah. and does a very successful job from what I hear, in continuing to grow what he's growing and he's doing an awesome job. In saying that, though, um, knowing what I know right now and being a student and a voice of, just get out of the way, mate. Let this thing go. It's okay to be the investor. You've done all the hard work. Let someone below you or bring someone in that's going to manage this thing to take it to the next level or the next generation. Just get out of the way. Knowing what I know right now, and this is 2017, let's just say, I should never, ever have sold that business. Oh, okay. So you you regret selling it? Right now I do. Right. So we did, and the year was about 2002. By the time we got out of that, officially it was early 2003. I was at the crossroads with a whole heap of other businesses and Major events supply. Um, we, we were the ma- we were a supplier to major event companies who were creating major golf events throughout the world. The Qantas Classic was one of them. So we used to manufacture golf bags, umbrellas, polo tops oh, yeah. on behalf of Qantas, Sony, BMW, blah 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 blah. Their major events, corporate golfing events, were in Las Vegas. We were shipping containers there. Great business, a lot of fun. Um, we would eventually, we would occasionally be invited to some of those events as um, merchandise suppliers, um, got into hospitality businesses. But in 2005, um, I met that guy at a barbecue that said, Mate, you know what, you have an extreme passion around business and for the last 20 minutes, you've just blown my mind about, yeah. oh my God, what are you doing? And uh, he goes, I-, I need to introduce you to a couple of people and that was the, uh, the commencement of, um, I guess, getting into what was back then in 2005 known as the business coaching industry. In my mind, it was always mentoring that I I was referencing. And um, when I realised that this was an industry that ultimately was a business and a business model, I, um, I got in and um, I haven't looked back. I've been involved in some amazing organisations at the highest level. I've been a master licensor um, in partnership with Brad Sugars, is, who in fairness has to be credited with being the godfather of um, business coaching for small, medium enterprise in the world. Um, Brad Sugars um, and I sort of parted ways a couple of years ago, but I'm still on his call list as he's on mine and we have a strong relationship. Um, I entered as a business coach when I joined Action Coach and therefore to this day I continue being an owner and a leader of a business um, strategy, um, strategy business coaching business and um you know it's the people you meet along the way that definitely define who you are and how you handle and and deal with relationships how you deal with adversity and how you turn that into a positive and and make it um um, a positive 
how you deal um, negative into positive, how you ensure you deal with the grit and the resilience needed to persevere through tough times, through tough situations, through tough conversations. But if there's one thing I can um, definitely share with you, Matt, that ultimately defines everyone's opportunity to look at the upside. And I refer to this as um, the paradox of negotiation. And my current mentor, the great and, and the most amazing Keith, Keith Cunningham, who um, I'm so fortunate to have on my, in my corner. Oh, so you work, you work with so Keith? So Keith, Keith is my mentor and I, I visit him three times a year. And, oh, okay. He's come up on uh, this podcast before, yeah. So Keith, um, who has been in my corner for over 10 years, yeah. and, and, and in fairness, I've invested in over one million and a half, that's US dollars, in my education, right, since university, that is. And many people say, why are you so successful? And I just keep on investing in the things I don't know. Yeah. I keep on being okay to be told, hang on, why don't you look at it this way? And every time I get that one or two minutes of wisdom from people I respect and people I've given an opportunity to give me that feedback because that's a paid role. Yeah. I'm never going to get that at the bar, dipping into my third jar of peanuts, having my sixth pot. I'm only going to get it from people that have been there and done that. But the paradox of success is this. In order for me to get what I want, I've got to be okay to give you what you want. And in small business, because of the lack of not knowing what you need to know or looking at things from a different angle, we just feel that if it's meant to be, it's up to me. And that is the one anchor or glass ceiling that's always going to get in your way. So firstly, you've got to be an investor in understanding what are the things that I don't know. How is it that I can use words to my advantage, but also our advantage? How is it that I become a little more curious as to what is and what could be my opportunity versus being the reason why there is no opportunity? However, I'm frustrated because I want that opportunity, but I don't know how to get it, but I'm not prepared to put my hand up to say, help. The better you get at saying the word help, which is one of the most powerful words in the English language, the better you'll be to turn what is a broken and or a crossroad, whatever that is for you, to something that is unbelievable within 260, within 520 and potentially 1,040 weeks. And in my experience, you can turn something from what is to what could be, point A to point B, in 520 weeks, from the moment you get serious about putting your hand up, about your crossroad, no matter where you are on the chart, you can turn something absolutely amazing for what could be the next greatest Australian story, not because that's your goal, because that's your opportunity. The moment you can do what you do in Australia really well, the moment you can do what you do really well in your backyard, you can also do it in the rest of the world and it's not up to you to make that happen. It's up to you with the key in the vault to make sure you're opening that door and just be curious as to, okay, that's cool. I'm the investor. What do we need to invest in? That's all. And I'm so that's fortunate it. to be leading a business as an example for everything we teach and coach, we eat from our own cooking. Everything we do in our business here at Business Benchmark Group, led by me and followed through by people that are way better than me, is exactly what we coach and teach. In the first instance, our business owners and thereafter their chosen leadership teams. Yeah. And that's the game. Just a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up, Stefan, because uh, we've got a lot, I'll tell you what, we've got a lot out of this session this morning. In addition to learning, is there anything that you do uh, consistently maybe outside of work that allows you to be your best at work, whether that be an exercise program or a, a, a diet or meditation or is any element that you really rely on to be efficient here? Okay, so my, my, my principal driver um, my principal driver, and my ultimate number one, my number one value item in my hierarchy of values is family. However, family cannot be looked after if I'm not looking after my health. <laughs> That's come up a few times, yeah. So... Three times a week at 5.30 in the morning, I'm involved in a personal training program for which I invest in people 
to ensure I'm doing one more push-up than I could have if I was doing it on my own. And it's 5.30 in the morning because gone are the days where I thought I can do it in the evening and evening time is to be invested with my, my family and my younger children, particularly when I'm at home. So three times a week I am invested in a program called Heavy Haulers, which is an unbelievable program that, you know, you're going against your own pace but you're pushing against your own mental strength as to how hard, how fast, how far you can go. Awesome program. And um, twice a week I, um, I'm involved in martial arts and continue to be a, um, an, an avid student of martial arts, which gives me the meditation slash spiritual aspect to just body and mind. Yep. Um, I'm at a level where I also teach martial arts and, um, again, that's not about being brute force. That's about using the power of the mind and the aspect of self-defence versus self-attack. And it plays out in business. You know, a fit, a fit body will always serve a fit mind. A fit mind will definitely lead a fit body. Yep. You cannot take the pressures of, of, of business and ultimately life without having a balance between, you know, family life, business life, health and body, personal. That's my space. That's my zone, individual time. Yep. You can't have individual time mixed in with everyone else's time. You still need to isolate that. So I call that zone time yep. and that's what I do. I eat well, I drink well, I sleep well, I have fun well and everything's in moderation. I don't do the diet thing to a point where, you know, everything's in moderation. I enjoy I enjoy what life has on offer. I'm also not an extremist. Probably yeah. Best way to be, right? 70%. <laughs> oh, yeah, come back to the calendar. Very good. Now, um, do you think much about the transfer of what you know to your children in terms of a business sense? Uh, in, t- in terms of a life sense and what you stand for sense. Okay. And understanding the tool that is money is a life sense, not a business sense. The power of what that tool can do versus what you want it to do is a very distinct difference. Yep. There comes a time in life where the tool called money and quality of life meet an overspill. How you behave and how you're conditioned to behave is a life skill, not a money skill. So if... Or a business skill, in other words. If you don't mind me asking, how old are you? Are you, are so my eldest is 14. Okay. He's, yep. a, um, he's in year nine. He's a middle school captain and a, and a progressed leader in sport, in academia and in social. In other words, he's, he's a very balanced young, young man, yep. currently on a leadership program away from home for uh, 12 weeks. Oh, Mum's not happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Dad's yep. okay, although has been missed for the first three weeks, but, you know, he's cool. Um, our youngest, our youngest boy, um, he's he's twelve years old and year seven, and um, again, different profile, different um, character, but a leader and and a, and a classroom leader at that. Um, extroverted, very intelligent, but test the boundaries. So, knowing what I know and the and the power of. It's okay for people to have different personalities or yeah. behavioural traits. The way I communicate with my youngest boy, Harris, is slightly different to the way I communicate with my oldest boy, Stephen, because I understand they're two different behaviours. Yeah. Neither is right, neither is wrong. Understanding that and being a student of that allows me to have a great relationship with both, albeit I'm in a position where I need to still be their best father and best coach, which doesn't always have me being the most favourite person in the home every single time. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I've learned from my younger days, Matt, and it's interesting how it comes full circle. And it's quite interesting having Stephen away from home, and he, you know, he, he has restricted communication, and he chooses not to communicate. Oh, there <laughs> I you remember go. my mum saying, "Hey, you're going on that holiday with your friends. Please stay in touch with us." And I, I used to say to her, "I'm only going to ring you if there's something wrong." Yeah. It's like, <laughs> holy shit! <laughs> now I know what it felt like. Yeah, yeah. And watching, and watching my wife, uh, my beautiful wife, who's an awesome. Um, you know, I guess, trait to my success and reason for my success and our success, um, full stop, you know. Having a successful home life will definitely lead 
to so many things. So what I pass on to my children is decency, um, being okay that someone you may be speaking to or something you expect from someone doesn't go the way you planned. It's got nothing to do with you. It's how you ultimately communicated or understood what was their issue or challenge or decision not to do something that you expected them to do. Yeah. So teaching them that is not so much teaching them tolerance of mediocrity, but it's teaching them that people are different. And if you want something for someone else to do more than they do, there's a challenge. Sometimes it's your challenge, not theirs. Yeah. Yeah, Does that make sense? I think I have very young kids at the moment, but uh, I think that there'd be a lot of parents listening to this who understand exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, and the exciting thing is we're, um, we're, we're, we're just creating a, a program and it's going to be launched in 2018 where we're actually inviting our business owner clients with their children between the ages of 12 and 17 oh, to wow. do a weekend retreat and focusing on the fundamentals, you know, this stuff that I just shared with you, um, the, the power of communication, you know, the acceptance of social media and or those devices and aspects of our children, you know, millennials' life. It's part of their life now. So maybe not creating brick walls around it and us against them and taking it away from them versus how do we collaborate? Yeah. But on the same token, how do we help young children collaborate with parents and just bridge what is right now maybe a rifting um, a rifting, um, I guess, wedge as far as it's parents not understanding children and children not understanding parents. Interestingly enough, Matt, I was just coming up um, and, and, and one of our clients, I bumped into one of our clients who said, hey, did you hear what happened? And because I'm a school president um, at the local school, um, one, of our, one of our students um, tragically passed away last week and the principal was talking about it but didn't go into details. And I haven't had a chance to figure out or ring John to figure out what exactly happened. It was a year 11 student. And um, I'm going to share this and, and I'm not meaning to, um, I guess, um, cause any grief across this interview and choose to, to include it if you wish as part of the editing. I'll say this now. But um, in a three-second um, conversation I had downstairs, I was told what exactly happened. And um, this, this young child, um, someone's son, Someone's brother um, decided to um, jump in front of a moving train last week. And I couldn't think of anything worse. Um, I couldn't think of anything worse. And, and, and the number of incidences and challenges that are going on right now for many young people and, uh, and, 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 and even middle-aged and later-aged people. And, and there's a greater conversation around mental mental illness and the black dog and, you know, and I just think one way of dealing with it is just opening up the channels of communication, opening up the, um, you know, a, the, the different ways of communicating and you don't need to necessarily be an expert at this. You just need to be open to having a much more viable conversation as to what's going on. And um, I'm a true believer that, no different to what you know our parents did in their era and what they knew. No different to us being parents, and there's no book on this, you know, and what we do to our par- our children, and ultimately the peer pressure in this day and age, and the instant gratification seeked. I just think the better we just break down the barriers that there's nothing right, nothing wrong. It's just the conversation on the table. Yeah. And our responsibility as parents and or influencers for the younger generation is. Open up the channels of communication. There's times to be assertive and times to say, hang on, right from wrong. But maybe let's choose a different way of communicating that. Don't need to dance around the fire or I'm not, I'm not, I'm not advocating and I'm certainly not an example of, you know, the marshmallow club. But I'm also about, you know, the hard edge of the way it used to be done. It's changing. Yeah, I agree. And, yeah. and, and there's hundreds and thousands of people around the world, in our backyard, in, in the story that I was just, you know, exposed to, which, which again, you know, knowing the family but not knowing exactly what happened because it's only, it's only last Thursday that this happened. Oh, wow. Um, I knew it happened in the community. I got some feedback as to it happened and some of the things that needed to happen in that school community and supporting community around it, but I just haven't had a chance to find out the extreme detail. So listening to what Christine just shared with me downstairs and, and you know, preparing for our conversation right now, front of mind for me, it's like it's not worth it if you get to the top and you've got that sort of situation surrounding you. So 
parents, business owners, business leaders, just decent people everywhere. Let's just open the communication channels. And it just doesn't have to be left to the experts. You don't need to be an expert. You just need to be open to a different way of communication. And um, I think when it's all done and dusted in my career, in my journey, in this stage of my life moving into the next, that that's, you know, children and the ability to keep on giving them a platform for, 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 for a better version or a higher standard of who they are today, knowing full well that we're not judging them, they don't need to judge themselves either. I think, in my opinion, that's my journey as to, you know, what is it that I see being my contribution in the next phase. And I'm talking, I mean, I'm in my late 40s now. I'll keep on doing what I'm doing because I love what I'm doing till the death. And, you know, my, my job, my opportunity takes me around the world. I've written two great books. There's a third one in writing. But I feel the ability to um, share with great business owners, awesome business owners, up and coming, unbeknown to them, amazing business owners, the ability to communicate and be better for their community, their immediate community, to help the next, you know, the next generation coming through knowing that they have someone to talk to without being judged. You know, I see that as a rite of passage and I'm, I'm really, yeah, not so much because of what I just heard then because that's disturbing and I don't want that influencing what I'm sharing but there's an opportunity for more of us doing more and there are some great programs being um, delivered right now but there's room for more. You know, I agree. There's a, a real, um, there's a lot of room to do a lot as you just said and I know of a few people who are really starting to look at that youth, teenage sort of um, age group and going, you know what? There's a lot we could be assisting with and helping with here. So the full credit to you moving into that space and, and, and trying to help, that's uh, admirable. Um, one question I was, or, or changing tracks a little bit, one question I ask everyone, if you could have one law changed, what would it be? Once you hit your first million dollars in uh, revenue, mm-hmm. in business, you get a $100,000 business coaching grant delivered by people that have grown at least four businesses and succeeded with at least three of them in their life. And that would be some sort of government grant? I mean, without getting into the political... From, uh, a, capitalist, of... from a capitalist perspective, not a socialist perspective. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Do you have and any... hence why I said the first million dollars, not I've got an idea, give me $20,000 to see where I go. You've got to get some runs that on one, the board. That one failed, let me do it again. That the handout mentality is not – I believe that your first million dollars in business yep. is the hardest education you'll ever have. When you get there, you're a little bit more seasoned to ensure the next million dollars has to, does not need to be as hard. Do you have any book recommendation except, recommendations except for your own? And I must say that I've almost finished from uh, Deadwood to Diamonds. It's a um, – there's a lot in that book. It's a lot coming at you, I've got to say. So if that was your intention in, in writing it, then um, you've done a great it job. It took me three years to write the first one and I thank you for saying that. And I'd never say uh, – I'd never endorse my books as the books to read, just just to be clear on that. Yep. But I, um, it took me three years to write that and I always came from a point of view, if I picked it up, as I do many books, will this keep me going for that extra half an hour even though I was fighting sleep to keep on reading? So that was the intention with the first book, From Deadwood to Diamonds, in 2014. It took me three years to write that, as it took me two and a bit years to write the second book, How to Grow a Business and, and ultimately delivering it at a diamond standard. So both books, in fairness, and, and the most recent book, the feedback we get from a global perspective is, wow, like it's not a game changer. I never intended them for them to be game changers. But they're so relative to the audience that reads it that it's like, wow, got so much out of that yeah. and it still keeps on in, in a fundamental sort of way serving. So if there's one book, if there's one book that I believe is worth reading and, and you've made it challenging because you've said one, and it's an easy one because it's written in a fable style. It's Patrick Lencioni's book, the five dysfunctions of a team. I'd love if you asked me five books, but I'm going to honour your... Uh, Give me one more because I sense that you want to... You've, you've got a couple more up your sleeve there. 
Now you've made it hard again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, the next one will definitely be um, good to great. Hey, Jim Collins. Um, Is that right? Good, good to great. Yeah. Jim Collins. That's a great book too. But I think you need to be at a slightly elevated level to really understand that. Well, Just some, slightly. Yes, yeah, some public um, – or most of them are public exams. Just slightly elevated. So – the Five Dysfunctions of a Team, Patrick Lencioni, it's about 170 pages. It's written in a fable, so it's like a, a story about a makeup business and what happens, yep. and um, it's an easy read, but it's just yeah. some real home truths about the importance of great systems, good people. Great people, great systems, influencing great systems, becoming better systems. The game of business is lifting the standard. If someone wants to get in contact with you, Stefan is interested in what you do, where's the best place to, to find you? So businessbenchmarkgroup.com.au is a, is a great way to, uh, to connect and or, you know, again, in a subtle sort of way, be kept up to date with our, our messaging. We, 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 we write an awesome, um, again, piece every Saturday morning. We call it a, uh, a brain stretch every Saturday morning. It goes out at 7 a.m. By 7.04, you're done. But you're thinking about, okay, cool, that works for me yep. and how do I ensure um, I keep on making it work for me? So that's an easy thing to get enrolled in. We have a, a business health check on the um, on, that, on that website on the first page as well, which is an awesome investment of your three – of three minutes just asking you a different set of questions about your current business and where you rank and or sit. On the back of that, you'll get a conversation going with one of our internal team, no obligation, just to ensure you understand – um, your 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 score and what if anything you could do next. Some of that ends up being clients of ours. Some of them are just getting some good advice, and that's cool. See, we can't want it more than them. And the other way you can get in touch with me is through my um, my, uh, my my actual personal name, stephenkazakis dot com. So I'll make it at stephenkazakis dot com. Either of those websites. And our, and our motto, as I said earlier, Matt, is just make it easy for people to um, get engaged. Make it easy for people to buy. So we never sell. It's definitely about making it easy for people to buy. Yeah. Every one of our clients are very intelligent, very smart, very progressed people. We just help them understand the next bit doesn't have to be a home run. It's just the next level of progression. Awesome. Well, Stefan, I'm going to let you get back to your day because I know that you've got a lot more in your calendar that needs to get done. Um, thanks for carving out a little bit of time to do this. I want to make a quick mention of Russell Beard who made this connection and helped this come together. It's been awesome and Cheers, mate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Awesome. Thank you for the interview. Hey, everybody. It's Matt again. Thanks for listening. Just a couple of things before you guys clock off. You can get all Trench Talk episodes at xrm.com.au forward slash podcast. You can also sign up for other goodies at the same site. Just plonk your email in there and you are covered. That's x for x-ray, r for Romeo, m for mike.com.au forward slash podcast if you really like what i'm bringing you please head to itunes subscribe to this show and leave a review right there and lastly if you want to contact me directly type the at symbol followed by mr matt reynolds into your search bar and you'll find all the social links goodbye